Okay, good morning, everybody. We're going to start Colossians chapter 1. Um, I already was talking today on like those up, up roll out news videos. I'm hoping it's not as windy here, and I want you to be able to hear me. So I'm trying to go on this side of the highway. All right, there's a few key verses. If I taught this at the house, uh, I would have made sure I hit those verses. Uh, so let me try to hit on them real quick, then I'll do a little introduction and get into the chapter. Um, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has tra translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The firstborn of every creature and the first begotten of the dead. And another mystery, we did this in Ephesians, and the mystery now is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I just, like I said, I would have uh, tried to double check, and I even left my little Bible open to recheck on that. Okay, uh, Colossians. Colossians, Colossae, was a city that was evangelized when we did our study in the book of Acts. It kind of talks about how the message got to this city called Colossae, which this letter is written to. I believe it was Acts 19. And when Paul stayed at Ephesus, there for some say two year period, three year period, but he stayed at the city of Ephesus, planting that church, the Apostle Paul, for a long time. And then there's one verse in Acts 19 that says, and from there, the word of the Lord went out into all of Asia, all into Asia Minor. Okay. That was more than likely the time when one of those converts went back to Colossae, and that was kind of how that church was planted. Now, Paul will mention the name of that person in Colossians 1 verse 7 about Epaphras, okay? That man's name was Epaphras, and that's how the gospel got to Colossae. The city itself, sort of like what we talked about in the book of Acts, some of the cities at the time of the first century, in the time of Paul, lost their glory. Meaning, a few hundred years before, under the, uh, Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire, some cities, like we have in society today, they rise to prominence, and then you might interact with them when they're not as glorious as they used to be. And Colossae is one of them, because at this stage, at the time of the writing, they were sort of like a second-rate market town. There were other few cities around there at this stage that were, if you will, the bigger cities, the better cities, okay? South Texas, you got some that are considered like, you know, small towns. And Colossae kind of had that reputation at this point. It's in Asia, Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Okay, that's kind of a little intro to it. What are the key heresies or things that Paul deals with in this book? You know, one of the first, I have some of my old radio messages, like when I used to make cassette tapes, and I, I got rid of some of them, but I still have them on cassette tapes just as a reminder to see them there in my office. I think the first message when I started, not the first message I ever preached, but when I started a, a home church, we rented an old hospital in Kingsville. I believe it was called uh, Legalism Spoils Rotten. And I got that from the letter of Colossians. I do remember that, how I can remember the first message in our little hospital building, but I believe that was it. Because as I read the New Testament, and I already taught the book of Romans and Galatians, Hebrews, to me, the letter to the Colossians, especially at that time in my experience, when we get to chapter 2, I felt it was refuting legalism. And I was in a good church, but you, some would describe that particular, it was a fundamental Baptist church. They were a good church, but in a sense, I felt maybe legalistic. And Paul will combat that in this letter. 
So to me, I think Paul deals with legalism just like he did in Romans and Galatians. But some of the commentaries on Colossians will say he's just refuting another heresy which would be called asceticism. And asceticism would be like extreme self-denial. And yes, he does refute that. Some critics, and the high critics, which you've heard me discuss the last few weeks, they claimed, oh, Paul could not have written the book, the letter to the Colossians. And this letter, he mentions he wrote it two times, okay? Paul says he's the one writing the letter. And the reason the high critics, I do a little of this for background, <coughs> because they say Paul was also refuting the false wisdom, the false knowledge, the Gnostics, and therefore Gnosticism wasn't fully developed until the second century, therefore Paul couldn't have written this in the first century, and that's ridiculous, because Gnosticism was already in its seed form, which I've taught about Gnosticism over the years, and it was already there, okay, so those are not good criticisms. All right, Paul... In all of his letters, except for Galatians, he begins with like, a I believe I got it right, he, begin he begins with thanks and praise for the work of God that began to take place. And the word of the Lord took root and brings forth fruit in them as it does in all the world, okay, all the known world. And then he prays, he mentions in chapter one of Colossians, he prays for them, he thanks God for them, praise unceasingly for them. What is one of the keys, if you will, to church planting or for an effective message? It's prayer. You know, the great reformer, Martin Luther, 16th century, he prayed many hours every morning, many hours. And somebody said, you got so much work to do in this reformation this movement you know how could you have that much time to pray like wasting it and he said I would not have been able to accomplish any of it unless I put all that time aside you know the I just came to my mind but the other day time in the kingdom is very interesting and I've had this experience a few times over the years but it happened again the other day in my system of praying, studying, reviewing, all that it takes is normally a three hour time every morning. And it usually works out if I get up at five, which I did today, just about three hours later, I check, I'm done. But for some reason I was short on time, but I actually did whatever I had to do, the reviewing or the making of the video and the putt. And I looked at it and it was done in half the time. But I did not miss a part of my prayer, I did not miss anything. And that's happened with me before. If you will, God's outside of time and in the spirit, he'll allow you to accomplish what you need to accomplish. Now, I'll walk back towards my car, hopefully, and I'll still teach right now. He praises God for the work that's been done in them. He, and then he mentions the blood of the cross and redemption through the cross and also like the prayer that we saw in Ephesians, that God would, they would be strengthened with all might, the one in Ephesians, by his spirit in the inner man, and then all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Now this is one of the prison epistles of Paul. Ephesians was one as well. In the last chapter of Acts, when we did our Acts study, we mentioned Paul, that book of Acts ends, Acts 28, with Paul awaiting his appearance before Nero, the Roman emperor. And he has his own rented place and people are coming to Paul freely and he's teaching to them the, uh, the kingdom of God. Okay, from that time period, which was about AD 60 to about AD 62, Paul was in jail. Now, from what we understand somewhat from history, because scripture doesn't tell us, but when did Nero execute him then? Probably 64 AD, 65 AD. So, more than likely there was a rearrest and he was later executed. But as far as we know, Paul 
at that two year period from 1860 to 1862, he bet, penned four letters, which we call the prison epistles. Ephesians, this letter Colossians, I believe the other two are Philippians and Philemon. And that's why we refer to them as prison epistles. And what is he writing to them in this chapter? He says, in suffering and in difficulty, do it with joyfulness. And he's penning this letter sitting uh, under house arrest, if you will. Then we're going to see Jesus Christ as the firstborn of all creation. And then right after that statement, Paul says, everything, dominions, thrones, invisible powers, kingdoms, dominions, everything was created by him and for him. Now, when I've talked this last year about the creation account and how it's hard for our minds to kind of grasp it, but in the beginning, we read in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Greek word for that is Logos. Now, in the early centuries of Christianity, the debates that the church councils had primarily focused on what we call Christology. How do we understand the person and the nature of Christ? I, be, I accept and believe all of the creeds, the councils, the ones we refer to as ecumenical, meaning they were all pretty much accepted by all Christians. But for the first few centuries, this would be the debate that raged on our understanding of Christ. And in the 200s and 300s, there was a bishop by the name of Arius, A-R-I-U-S very influential and I'm sure he was very sincere but from scripture like this the firstborn of all creation Arius began teaching and many believed because he was influential at the early church like a church father they believed that Christ was not the eternal word and Arius would say there was a time where he was not. Now, there was another famous bishop, Catholic leader at that time, who disagreed strongly. His name was Athanasius. And this debate raged. At the end of the day, Athanasius won. This is during the uh, fourth century under Constantine, the Roman emperor, all right? A lot of history there. But how could sincere, till this day, the, uh, I think it's the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but there were many Christian churches at that period of time, all under the head of orthodoxy. Then you had the, the split with the East and the West. And then you had, if you will, the Greek Orthodox Church in the East part of the empire and the Roman Catholic Church in the West. And uh, you had Constantinople and Byzantine and you had Rome, of course, for the West. And it was 1054 AD when the final split was made. That's when the Orthodox, officially, they both condemned each other. But it was scriptures like this one that caused some, I think, well-meaning people to say, if this says, the one I'm quoting in Colossians 1, that Christ is the firstborn of all creation, that would lead some to say that meant he was the first creation of God. Now there's a few other scriptures that people use when talking about it. The one that settled the issue, I think I just quoted already on the video, which is John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, the Logos. The Word was with God. So now you have a distinction and the Word was God. And in the Creation Act, which I've tried to speak about before, if you will, the Word was always, when we say Trinity, we say God in, in eternity, without beginning, without end. He had fellowship 
in the Godhead, okay? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And some have said, but what did, there was no creation before God decided to speak, and that's correct. But that word, if you will, if I did not speak a word for a day, but that word is still in me, and then there comes a time where I speak that word. That word wasn't just, if you will, created, but at the moment I speak it, it's manifested, it comes forth. And so in a simple way, what this passage is saying, the firstborn of all creation, if you look at the following verses in Colossians 1, it's saying, before anything else was made, that word came forth. Not that he was then created at that time, but it's the act of creation itself. And God said, let there be light. And that puts Jesus Christ in the preeminence position of everything, okay? This first one, firstborn of all creation, is not the same as now the second one I'm gonna to get to in this chapter, all right? Some, I think, confuse that. In this context, firstborn of all creation is saying, before all creation, the word of all things were made by him and for him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Then we get to the next one in this chapter, the first begotten of the dead, which refers to Jesus as the first to rise from the dead to die no more. Now, when I did my uh, King study, we talked about the first resurrection in scripture, which was Elijah the prophet raising up the woman's son. And we also know there were other Lazarus in the Gospel of John, famous resurrections in scripture. But all those people, they were not raised to never die again. We have the story, of course, I spoke recently about uh, the two people in scripture who were taken, Elijah and Enoch, but you don't have anyone else that was raised from the dead in a glorified body to never die again. He's the firstborn. So he's the firstborn of all creation, preeminent in that, and the firstborn from the dead to never die again. Now, these two verses, there's others that speak about Christ, but these were the ones that were difficult for people to grasp and we can understand that. He has delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness, the power of darkness, and we have now been translated into the kingdom of his son. So we also understand we are now in the kingdom. There's a future expression of that kingdom, but we're in that kingdom now. Then he talks about the mystery. Now he's speaking to the Gentiles, the Col Colossians were Gentile believers, but he says, and this is the mystery, that Christ is also now in you. Christ in you, the hope of the Lord. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us. So it's, it's the gospel that he's teaching them that's gonna be the answer, if you will, to the heresy that he's gonna deal with which you observe, we'll get to later in our study, you observe days and times and seasons and years, the worship of angels who rebuke. So how is this playing then? He, Jesus is the preeminent one. You don't just simply see him as one uh, among many figures, which you had in the Greek pantheon. Jesus is the preeminent one and he lays out the case. And God himself, he also says in Colossians 1, God himself has made us meet to be partakers of this inheritance in the light. He made us qualified through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's where we're at. And then he talks about all of himself. And his mission is to fulfill the work of God. See that? He saw his mission penning this letter house arrest in Rome. He didn't see it as, oh, I didn't fully grasp all of the promises of prosperity or whatever. He said, no, my mission is to fulfill the word of God, to make them among all these Gentiles with these great riches. And he was praying for these 
churches is that their eyes would be open. There's so much more to what God has done. We also see that the reason Jesus is shown as the firstborn of all creation because everything's been God says, I'm the one. I'm sure he was quoting this a few weeks ago. I don't know if he was on good one. But God says in Isaiah, I'm the one who created the smith that blows the coals in the fire. The blacksmith. God says, how do you think that blacksmith figured out if I get this piece of steel metal hot enough, I can shape it, I can form it people have figured that out. I'll try to sit in and finish, make sure I hit all the verses. They figured out if you get it hot enough, eventually, let's see how long it went, eventually you can form it and you can shape it. And God, through the prophet Isaiah, is saying, I'm the one that created that man, the smith, the blacksmith, who blows the coals in the fire that brings forth an instrument for his work. And look at the next verse. I think it's Isaiah, the later chapters. And I have created the waster to destroy. I have created the waster to destroy. Even in the rebellion, Satan is fulfilling the purpose of God. He does not ordain evil, but everything is going to serve the will of God. And so what that's how that's how come in the First chapter. Now let me check. I wrote these real, or I circled these real quick before I got out. That's why we see him in preeminence, not just over the church, which it talks about, not just the first to rise from the dead, but before everything. He was before all things. And John one again says, "He lighteth every man that cometh into the world. All life, it came from him. God spoke." We, be, we became alive because of the Word of God. Let me check my few notes, or the ones I circled, and see if I hit them all. Giving thanks unto the Father, which made us meet to be partakers, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. It's Colossians 1, verses 13, 14. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth. And you who were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. Let me end on that one. I don't think I mentioned that one. And that'll be it for today. The work of redemption, a lot of times, a lot of times we teach that our souls are saved, correct. Spirits made alive, correct. And a lot of good teaching says, but to renew the mind is a long, arduous process and it takes a lot of work. Is that true? Paul's famous for the renewal of the mind verse, many of them, but Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. By the renewing of your mind. How do you and I approach that? Do we approach it in a way that kind of says salvation Christ died for us his blood was shed for us and that saves our soul or our spirits were born again 
but the whole process of renewing the mind is quoting, memorizing. I've memorized a lot of scriptures. I think that verse, the last one I quoted from Galatians, I think it refutes that. Look what he says, and you who are enemies and alienated in your minds by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled to the body of his flesh through death. The power of the cross is what renews the mind. I think we make the mistake that Paul's going to refute in this letter. It's not by will worship. You see, you, you don't renew your mind in your own strength and your own power. I think actually that's like a form of legalism. Because what he's saying in that verse, the last one I'm quoting from Colossians, is the work of the cross has done that. The work of the cross, you who are enemies and alienated in your minds by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled through the body of his flesh through death. I'm hoping you can hear it at the end. So reconciliation of our mind, the renewing of our mind, is a function of what Jesus did. So then what is he telling us? He's telling us to see that grace, to see that grace, to understand it. You see, it's renewed to the cross, okay? It's renewed to the cross. Grace deals with that as well. And when you stray from that, which these Colossians are gonna do, that's who's gonna rebuke. When you think it's through extreme self-denial, the observing of days and times and seasons, a form of legalism, like I said, then all of a sudden, you see, if you will, I had a good talk with my friend, uh, one of my friends yesterday. And you know, it's interesting because this friend, he's, he, I guess he went to AA years ago, because he's familiar with it. But he's doing okay, but he still drinks. And he knows I quit, and he'll quit on his own. But I notice he functions. Even though he still drinks. And as we were talking, I said, you know, but sometimes we see whether it's sobriety to a cop, sometimes we see that from a law mentality. I'm still sober five years, three months now, okay? But we see it as this is a hard job and it's going to consume a big part of my life, if you will, to be free from sin, from uh, addiction, or whatever it is. And the whole issue of the New Testament is we're not saved by the works or efforts of the law or the flesh, but by grace, by the work of the cross. And, and when we talk about the renewing of our mind, remember, you were enemies and alienated in your minds by wicked works. You say, how do I change those wicked thoughts? cross he has now reconciled to the body of his flesh through death the crucifixion is what renews your mind it's the message of grace i'm glad i looked because that was the last one i wanted to comment i did a little brief on the post with this you'll see a little introduction and being i never wrote on it before i'm trying to write a little bit more on the study but we'll end it here. I'll end with the prayer. Hopefully you heard it. Father, I thank you for all my friends. I pray you bless each one. I pray that the word of the Lord will go forth. It will bring forth fruit in all the earth, like Paul said to the Colossian believers. And we just ask for the kingdom of God to come. In Jesus' name, amen.